Welcome to the Wild at Heart podcast. I'm John Eldridge. And as we always do, before we jump into content and story and things that we hope will strengthen your heart, we pause. We pause to release the day, release the week, whatever, whatever's been clamoring for your soul. We take a moment at the start to let that go and to allow the presence of God to come more clearly to us. So let's do that now. And what we pray is, Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. Everyone, Lord, everything I release right now to you in order to find you and to find my own heart. And we pray that our union would be restored with you. Restore our union, Lord Jesus. Restore our oneness. Use this podcast to deepen our union and to speak and move and come to me in the ways that I need you to this day and this week. In your name, we all pray. Amen. Well, friends, here we are in the first week of March together, and we're shifting directions. Um, We've been in some I would say fairly serious uh, material, Alan. Oh, yeah. And Very. important, critical for us to to be thinking through. Um, we're coming back to the love story now. We live in a love story set in a world at war. Mm-hmm. And it's important that you talk about the war and how you guard your heart in it and how you navigate your heart through it. But we don't want to lose track. It's not all war. No. And if we start to think it's all war or we feel the heaviness most of our days, I think we do start to lose heart. We do start to forget what it is we even, when we have to battle, what we're battling for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's come back to the love story. And we are, we're going to start a conversation through several weeks um, and some dialogue and some some fun old, uh, actually, we're going to go back and grab some old conference material on the sacred romance that we think you are going to love. But I'd like to begin with uh, a, a quote from chapter one, the inner life, the story of our heart is the life of the deep places within us, our passions and dreams, our fears, and our deepest wounds. It is the unseen life, the mystery within, what Beekner called our shimmering self. It cannot be managed like a corporation. The heart does not respond to principles and programs. It seeks not efficiency, but passion, art, poetry, beauty, mystery, ecstasy. These are what rouse the heart. Indeed, they are the language that must be spoken if one wishes to communicate with the heart. And this is why Jesus so often taught and related to people by telling stories and asking questions. His desire was not just to engage their intellects, but to capture their hearts. Indeed, if we will listen, a sacred romance calls to us through our heart every moment of our lives. It whispers to us on the wind, invites us through the laughter of good friends, reaches out to us through the touch of someone we love. We've heard it in our favorite music, sensed it at the birth of our first child, been drawn to it while watching the shimmer of a sunset on the ocean. The romance is even present in times of great personal suffering, the illness of a child, the loss of a marriage, the death of a friend. 
Something calls to us through experiences like these and rouses an inconsolable longing deep within our heart, wakening in us a yearning for intimacy, beauty, and adventure. This longing is the most powerful part of any human personality. It fuels our search for meaning, for wholeness, for a sense of being truly alive. However we may describe this deep desire, it is the most important thing about us, our heart of hearts, the passion of our life, and the voice that calls to us in this place is none other than the voice of God. Alan? Yeah, I was just smiling as you were reading that. I felt hope rising. It is such a beautiful invitation that God offers us in terms of intimacy and romance. And and I think the enemy works overtime to help us either forget it or disbelieve it or get distracted from it. And so as you were reading that, like I just wanted to get those words framed carved on a wall (laughs) that I look at every day. I I know. I know. I know. Two reactions, right? The longing of, wait, what? Mm -hmm. Like, I I used to believe that. Yeah, right. (laughs) And then, where the hell did that go? Right. And knowing that God hasn't gone anywhere, the invitation hasn't gone anywhere, but where have I gone? Like, what has happened to dull that? Yeah, so I'm... I love that passage. And friends, we're, we are looking forward to this conversation and this journey with you. Alan, do you remember when the book, The Sacred Romance, first came into your life? I don't even know this story. Where were you at I, that point? I do. And it, yes, it's a story that I think you're going to really enjoy. So I was in Christian Publishing back in Nashville when I got this book. And the book is from Thomas Nelson, and I worked at Thomas Nelson. And so what they did was every Friday, they would deliver a box of books to the executives from all the divisions. And then you could pick what you wanted, take it home, give the rest back. They'd put it in the warehouse. And so that Friday comes along, and I'm going through the books, and I'm teaching a large Sunday school class of young marrieds at the time. And I was like, oh, Sacred romance. This will be great for a future marriage <laughs> teaching because <laughs> yeah. we all need more romance. And and this will be God's word on how to have romance in our marriage. And so I took the book out. Hadn't heard of you because it was your first book, right? Hadn't yeah. heard of Brent. And so took it home, put it on a shelf where it sat with other marriage books for probably half a year. And when it came time to teach that class on greater intimacy in marriage— I pull that down, I start reading it, and I'm just blown away because God had wooed me into something that if I had known what it was at the time, I don't even know if I would have gone for it. Oh, gosh. I was so driven at that time, and I'd never thought of romance as a word I associated with God, ever. And so to me, the, the young man I was at that time romance was a totally horizontal experience. It was what you had with the person you loved. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <laughs> not well, just okay. me. Moving, First, yes. Person to person. Moving right yeah. along. <laughs> but not not vertical, meaning, you know, like I, I just never saw my relationship with God in any way as intimate romance of the heart. I wasn't living from the heart. And so— God snuck up on me with this book, and I remember reading it just like one of those books that you can't put down. So I'd be on the couch reading it, and then I'd be reading it in bed at night, and then I'd wake up and I'd be reading it. And Kelly's going, "What? What? What's going on with this book?" And I'm like, "I, I think I'm awakening to something that I've never even had a glimpse of before." that could change everything. So that was my first experience. Yeah, and I mean, as an executive cranking out Christian books. I mean, you guys had to produce something like 70 books a year, which is more than a book a week. Right. And when you take all the divisions, there were more than 500 books a year 
easily coming out yeah. from, and so that was one of 500, but it was the one. Now, we have very dear friends in Christian publishing, but I do have to say, if you want to lose heart, <laughs> <laughs> work in a large Christian publishing house, because it's just the pace and the amount of content and the fire hose. It's like, how can you... How can you find God again? Right. We have such good friends. And I grew up, I spent 20 years in Christian publishing, which seems like a lifetime ago. But I think one reason it's easy to lose heart in that industry and similar ones is you're always chasing the next big idea because you've got to have that next book out. And so the people in it, you have to stay with a radar for what's next, what's new, what's shiny. And in the process, it's hard to go deep in any one message because that book's here, gone, next, here. It's a conveyor yeah. belt. Yeah. And so this is the kind of book that when I discovered it, I realized, no, this is not a, huh, that's interesting, next. Yeah. It was a, there's some deep waters here that I need to go into. Well, I'm cracking up, my friend, because 20, I don't know, 20, almost five years later, you're sitting in this studio. Yeah working here in the life of the heart. So hmm. um, <laughs> two quick lines from the book in chapter one, for above all else, the Christian life is a love affair of the heart. It cannot be lived primarily as a set of principles or ethics. It cannot be managed with steps and programs. It cannot be lived exclusively as a moral code leading to righteousness. And then the hopeful thought is this, it is possible to recover the lost life of our heart and with it, the intimacy, beauty, and adventure of life with God. That's it. John, I think this book, it came out in, I believe, was it? 97. 97, okay. Okay. I knew it was the late 90s, and and it really was groundbreaking for its time because this was not what was being published at the time uh -uh. in any kind of Christian living, Christian spirituality. Like, it, it was this revolutionary book that really, I think, caused people to just— it, it, it caused them to see their own heart and God's heart in this way that they had never considered— in such a beautifully winsome way. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's no surprise to me that as you read it today, it still is fresh and new and so inviting into this life that that we were made for and created for, but somehow has grown dull. Mm -hmm. It happens to everyone's life. It was the reason that we wrote it. The Sacred Romance was born out of a number of conversations that Brent and I would have together. A lot of people may not know who Brent is. Like, how did you guys meet or how did your relationship begin? Mm. So, yeah, Brent um, Curtis, who uh, has been in the kingdom now for almost 25 years, um, was just a remarkable and beautiful man. He was a Christian therapist here in Colorado Springs, and he had a waiting list that was, I mean, months, eight months to get in because he was so good, but it was more than that. Like to be in his presence was to to encounter um, a father figure, a deep heart, um, and a, and a wildness that was so outside Christendom at the time. That yeah, I mean, um, Jen, our our colleague at the time, described him as a cross between. He looked like a cross between Clint Eastwood and a homeless guy under a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard you say that. <laughs> and uh, I met Brent as a therapist. I, I needed, I needed, uh, I was a client. I, I, um, we had young boys and I had these anger issues coming up and I'm like, whoa, I do not want to hurt my children. And it was it was alcoholic father father wound stuff that had yes. never been addressed. Okay, just um, and I called Dan Allender and said, "Who do you recommend in in Colorado Springs?" And he said, "Only one man." Mm. And he gave me Brent's number. I called and they gave me the spiel. They're like, "Well, 
you know, we'll put you on the waiting list. And I said, that's okay. I'll wait. And I think I waited six months. Um, and I mean, I think it was maybe the opening day or the second session that we just realized, oh, we're going to become really good friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's certain um, ethical protocols that therapists need to practice in terms of not crossing personal yes. boundaries. And, you know, you don't take clients out to dinner and that sort of thing right. for all sorts of appropriate reasons. Like, I believe in those boundaries. But we just blew all that to shreds and we went backpacking <laughs> together and, and fishing. And, and yeah, so Brent and I uh, wrote the book. So, John, did you feel like at that time, both of you, would you have said early on you realized you're on a similar journey, Very. even though he was the counselor? Very. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just uncanny because I, I would say, you know, again, we'd be driving along or we, we would sit in Phantom Canyon, which was an early, early pub uh, one of the first sort of micro brew pubs, yes. and now they're everywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, but it was one of the first ones here in in town, and we would sit in there late at night, and I'd say, "Oh my gosh, I was just reading this thing in Teresa of Avia," and and Brent would go, "What? That sounds exactly like what I was just thinking about the other day." And so mm. it was, yeah, it was God was moving, and we found ourselves caught up, and naming and putting words to the romance, putting words to the wooing of God and the pursuit of the heart and the recovery of the heart. Okay. So let me read another, another line here. Whatever form each of our intimate adventures has taken in our fantasies or in real life, this sacred romance is set within all our hearts and will not go away. It is the core of our spiritual journey. Any religion that ignores it survives only as guilt-induced legalism, a set of propositions to be memorized and rules to be obeyed. Someone or something has romanced us from the beginning with creekside singers and pastel sunsets, with the austere majesty of snow-capped mountains and the poignant flames of autumn colors telling us of something or someone leaving with a promise to return. These things can, in an unguarded moment, bring us to our knees with longing. So we talk a lot about the wooing, and I, I kind of wanted to focus on that this week, the unknown romancing, the Mm -hmm. God is wooing our hearts. He's been doing it since you were a child in the things that you love. And, and the important thing is that he is still doing it now, even in a world at war. Like it's a love story set in a world at war, but the love story is the more important part. And so as my heart began to come alive way before we came to Colorado, I I was right before Christ, and, and, and then as I came to Christ as at the age of 19, I was, I was a young man with a hugely romantic heart, a wilderness heart in L.A. I mean, it was, you know, 16 million people at the yes. time. It was just strip malls, and it, oh, it was horrible. Mm. And, and so the, the only wilderness we could get to, as soon as we could got our driver's licenses and began to get some freedom— some buddies of mine and I would drive out to the deserts to Joshua Tree, which was, um, it's now a national park. Back then it was barely even visited except by rock climbers like us. And we'd camp out there and I would get up in the morning and just wander the desert arroyos, the, the washes and, and listen to the birds as everything is waking up. It was the smells of the mesquite and and the jojoba. Yeah, it was just, mm. and the sound, even the sound of footsteps on, on desert sand, watching the wildlife come out, like God absolutely wooed my heart through that. And the hope of the romance is this. So last year, uh, some friends invited us down to spend some time with them in Arizona, and the house was in a you know, fairly ordinary neighborhood. It wasn't particularly 
full of romance, <laughs> uh, the romance yeah. of God. But I got up early in the morning as I normally do, and, and I went out to walk and pray. And at the end of the street, there was a dead end, and then there was a sign that said something about a, a wildlife preserve, desert. It was a desert preserve, no motorcycles, no da 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 mm -hmm. kind of thing, no camping, no fires. I'm like, wait, what? And then there was a trail leading into it. So I just walked down the trail, and it, it was it was as if eternity had just opened up for me again, because here are the sounds of the desert waking up in the morning mm -hmm. and the the particular coo of the morning doves and the the sweet little chirp that quail make and my the sound of my shoes on desert sand again. And so as soon as I could find an arroyo, I got off the trail and just started wandering up this this desert canyon wash and reaching down, picking up things, smelling, listening. It was like, oh, Lord, wow. you know my heart and you are wooing me again out of heartache and numbness and disappointment and loss. Like, here you are again. Here is the romance again. Wow. And it was right there. Like, you didn't have to even travel thousands of miles or mm -hmm. go across the globe or... Mm -hmm. I think that's a good analogy of how it is with us right now. We may feel really far from the romance that, that's being described or that you're reading about, and yet God is right here, and we can step back into that without a lot of self-effort, really, at all. It's, it's more, I think, more just saying, God, my heart longs for something more than this world can satisfy. And how do I step into that romance with you? Yes. Where are you wooing me now? Yeah. Where are you wooing me now? It, it may be through uh, a film, a documentary that you watch. It may be one of those coffee table books that nobody ever opens. <laughs> they just yeah. lay there, right. you know? Right. I opened it up the other day, <laughs> the one that we have, and it's these absolutely gorgeous pictures of the ocean. And it's like, ah, oh, there it is. There it is. There's the beauty that yes, mm. Lord. So yeah, to to be open to and to begin to wonder, where, where are you pursuing my heart right now? Where is the love story, even though I might only feel the world at war or, right. or the cost of, of all that? Right. And, and man, this world today, the external, the chaos, the, the cost of everything, the nonstop demands, it feels like there's less time than ever to do things that matter because we're just trying to keep our head above water. Mm. And yet God wants to romance us in those days and moments that we're in right now, just like he would have when we were younger. Well, it's the lifeline. Yeah. It's the lifeline in these moments. So I'm curious, what about for you in the last six months where yeah. Have, you, have you seen it? Has has it been whispering? Yeah, I have seen it. And it's played out in a, a lot of different ways. One way, you know, when you were reading that first excerpt, you were talking about the arts and poetry. And for me, story, reading, creativity is a huge love language between God and me. And he gets me curious about something, and then I follow him into whatever that was. And just about a month ago, I released a book, uh, The Eden Option, that we've talked about. But it was through a series of invitations God was giving me to, to realize there is a better way, a different choice to make that results in more intimacy with God, with Him, as you say, at the epicenter of everything. And so in the last six months, there was immense just joy and excitement about creating with God. Um, but John, also it's a letting go of a lot of things that I feel like I start to carry that I don't even know I'm carrying until mm. the backpack feels like it's not only on my back, but it's got about 200 pounds yeah. in it. And so for me, part of the ability to step into more with God is to release all these things that I felt like had to happen, needed to happen, control on some issues. Um, and just to, it felt like stepping into just all of a sudden this forest where you could breathe again, mm. where you could 
just relax and let things go and let things down. And I don't mean let responsibilities go, but I mean all the pressure. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine, an ally of this ministry, described it this way about a week ago to me in his own life. And I thought, man, that's it. He said, I had this vision or image, very vivid, of me in the middle of a lake and I had these oars and the oars on them, they were wood and on it was carved all of the things that I thought was up to me symbolically. And I was rowing and rowing and wasn't getting anywhere and was exhausted and the oars were becoming heavier and heavier. And Alan, he was telling me, I just at one point looked at the oars, let them go. They went into the water and I raised the cell and all of a sudden I said, God, I, I'm, I just want to go wherever you're inviting me in this season of my life. I'm tired of trying to just row against the wind and make it happen. And so I want to do this with you. And I actually want to see where you want to take me. And so he raised the cell and, and it was just the most beautiful image to me. Like I longed for that in that moment, yes. right? It feels utterly irresponsible, but man, the longing overcomes the sense of responsibility. At some point, the heart has to speak. Yes. And the sense that God knew far more than him where to lead him. Yeah. And so self-effort went away and and really it felt like intimacy and invitation into this new story with God. And that's that's what I've been after the last few months is, okay, God, if I were to get out of the way in terms of trying to make things happen, but stay close at your side yes. and want the intimacy of this journey with you, where could we go? What would that look like? What would the pace be? Yes. That story is reminding me of two things. One of my favorite poets, Antonio Machado, deceased Spanish poet, he has this great line where he says, mankind owns four things that are useless at sea, anchor, oars, rudder, and a fear of going down. <laughs> well, that's great, man. Yeah. And it's the wow. idea of yeah. if, if you will hoist the sail, if you will let the wind take you. Hmm. And then I'm remembering, we're going to put this in the show notes for you guys because I think you'll really enjoy. We used to use songs and and films. So as Brent and I began to teach sacred romance and and then of course the the story is that um Brent passed away. Uh and right right as all this was beginning and Craig stepped in and and began doing the sacred romance conferences with me about a year later. Um and we would we were we were some of the first people using film clips to teach. And and music, yeah. popular music, yes. you know, the Rolling Stones and things like that. <laughs> that because it because people are like, oh my gosh, that so speaks to my heart. I didn't know that was okay. I didn't know like that movie. Like, how is that movie about Jesus? And yes. we would go, well, take a look. It's actually the romance is all over this movie. And so we're going to put something in the show notes, which was a song we used to use in it by David Wilcox about setting the oars down. Huh. And, and letting the river take you where the river wants to go. And so, I, yeah, wow. I, I just remembered that song as you were relating your friend's story. Yes. So we'll, we'll pop that in the show notes because uh, I think folks will enjoy listening to that. The hopeful thought is that though we live in a world at war, and that war is at a very, very intense level, the romance is still the deepest, truest thing. God is still pursuing our hearts. And one of the ways to begin to locate it, this is very, very surprising, but as, as Brent and I were working with certain clients, he was my supervisor. I had just graduated. And uh, certain clients who were in pretty serious addictions I was asking one day, why doesn't God just move and, and free these, just take the addiction away yes. is what they were crying out for. Right. Please just take it away. And Brent said, because there is a precious part of their heart that is now trapped there. 
And if God were to just wipe it all away, they wouldn't recover that golden part of their heart that, that became attracted oh, to wow. and attached to the addiction. Friends, a lot of times the, the, the recovery of where God is wooing us is actually through our, our addictions, our self-comforting behaviors, the, you know, what you're looking forward to buying right now yeah. and, and what you're looking forward to eating or drinking tonight and what, you know, it's, it's one another, a man or a woman who is not your spouse awakens something in you and you're like, whoa, you know, that, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you go, wait a second, wait, wait, like, yes, that's not the source of life, but that has awoken something in your heart that God considers very, very precious mm. and wants to woo to himself. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I would just look at where are you going these days for comfort? Where are you where are you going these days? What are you daydreaming about? Where do you what do you zone out over? You know, what are you compulsively watching? What's the Netflix series that's captured you? Because those are indications of the life of your heart that has gotten buried in the busyness and the drivenness and, yeah, the, the post-COVID trauma and the disappointments and the loss, but the heart is still there and it's still looking for life. Right. I had a sense of this last weekend. Kelly invited me to dream with her about things we would do with our home if we if money were no object, which it is an object. <laughs> there are limitations, of course. But she was like, well, Alan, what would you do? Let's just sit for 30 minutes on a Saturday morning and dream. What would you do? And John, the, the revealing part was I would say things like, well, I'd love to have a fence in our backyard um, but we also need a deck and a redone because it's getting old and creaky. And we also need new floors in the house. And so with, with finite money, and she's like, no, 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 money's not finite. And I'm like, well, and it was so hard. I, even though I kept trying, I was letting the, the scarcity mindset or the limitations of what I thought I knew get in the way of really dreaming. And, and and we were laughing about it. And finally, I was able to kind of break free of that. And we had a blast. But I say that because when we allow God to woo our hearts and awaken our hearts again, I think part of it is we have got to break free from, but that'll never happen. Or, you know, I, I would have loved this, but now I'm too old. Or now this yes. this time has passed. And to go, well, actually... Part of God's wooing of us is allowing dreams to come alive in a way that feel impossible to us, but are not impossible to him the way he would work them together with us. And that, to me, is part of the romancing and the awakening is it actually is beyond what we might think is possible if we'll go into it with God. Yep. you got to let go of practicality. Practicality is in the way of the romance with God. You don't ask how, you just ask where. Where are we going? What do you, how are you coming to me? And it, and it is almost always in quiet, smaller things. Like I know, I know you wanna get to Hawaii this summer. I know you wanna <laughs> get to Europe. I know you're dreaming about a new car, you know, whatever it may be. But yeah, it's in the big things, but it's mostly in the small things. It be, it's in the dailies. And here's another fascinating way to get into it, friends, is what, what is no longer bringing life? Because something will come into our life. You know, maybe it's mountain biking uh, or, or it is riding and you've been enjoying that. And then the life seems to go out of it. And what we need to ask is, mm. where are we headed, Father? Because what we do is we find a little oasis and we camp there, yeah, right? And yeah. then we just ring that for all the life it can <laughs> give us. And, you know, but eventually the mountain biking begins to lose its transcendence. And, and, and partly it's because God will not let that golden part of our heart 
get trapped in things. Wow. He doesn't want it to, at least. So he will, the transcendence keeps moving and shifting in order to get us to follow it. And so I would, if you're not sure where the romance is right now in your life, friends, what used to bring transcendence, what used to bring that intimacy, that beauty, that adventure with God that's not producing right now? Go back to that place in your heart and mm. say, where did you go, Father? Where did you go, Jesus? What? Where are we moving that I missed the invitation that you were calling me onward? Yeah, that's good. And I just got disappointed and mad and <laughs> took my ball and went home. You know, <laughs> I think that could be an access into it as well. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm looking forward to some things we're going to do uh, in, in this series together on, on recovering the love story. We live in a love story set in a world at war. And so, Jesus, would you show me today, show me this week, where do I pick it up? Where do I pick up the trail? Where, where did I let go or walk away from the romance? Where did I mislocate it in someone or something? And I pray that you would pick up the trail with me. Show me where you are wooing the lost life of my heart now. I want to recover it.